Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Russ Mayo. I'm an assistant professor of English and writing program director here at PNW. So I wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your time uh, and in support of our distinguished speaker uh, for this semester. I'm going to introduce uh, Rachel before she comes up and then we'll have a conversation uh, uh, about water today um, for about an hour and then uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. Okay, um, so just a little bit of background. I'll, I'll try to be brief, uh, but there's so much to say. Uh, professor Rachel Haverlock is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she also directs the Freshwater Lab, an environmental humanities initiative focused on the Great Lakes and environmental justice. The Freshwater Lab is an initiative to communicate Great Lakes water issues to the general public, create tools to visualize the current state and future scenarios of water sources, engage unaffiliated groups in water planning, and train a new generation of Great Lakes leaders. With a focus on the Great Lakes Basin, the Freshwater Lab reaches outward to build relationships with water stewards from other parts of the world. The Freshwater Lab has produced two digital storytelling platforms. Freshwater Stories concerns Lake Michigan as it op opens eyes to the pressing water issues of the 21st century and offers a tool in which anyone can begin to learn about their water. And the Backwater River chronicles how the Chicago River came to flow backward and facilitate the offshoring of waste and transport of petroleum products. Both digital storytelling sites reach toward new imaginaries and relationships between people and their local watersheds. The Freshwater Lab convenes elected officials, researchers, activists, students, and artists for summits and events aimed at fostering new alliances and realizing future possibilities for a watershed that holds over 20% of the world's fresh water. Through the Freshwater Lab, Professor Haverlock offers interdisciplinary courses that draw students from English, urban planning, public policy, urban studies, and history, as well as annual internship, the annual internship program, which directly places UIC students in organizations working on water and the environment. Along with urgent public facing work, Professor Havelock researches questions of sovereignty, public trust, water delivery and privatization in the Great Lakes Basin. She's currently working on a book about the Great Lakes and their communities and what needs to happen for the Rust Belt to become the sustaining water belt. And that's the topic of our talk today. Along with practical plans for a future, a bright future along the Great Lakes, Professor Havelock sustains an acute interest in stories, particularly those that give rise to geography contour landscapes and draw borders. So Professor Haverlock's talk this afternoon is entitled The Water Belt, What Must and Could Happen Around the Great Lakes. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rachel Haverlock. Um, thank you to Russ. Thanks for everyone for um, having me here today. It's my first visit to another university in two years. So I can't tell you how happy I am to be in the room with people and to see your eyes and um, to be in this space together. So it's really exciting. And I think it's also so appropriate to be here within my own Lake Michigan watershed, uh, speaking to other people who draw from, uh, from the same source of water. So as you can see, um, I'm going to be presenting an argument for pretty wide scale transformation of our region from the much maligned Rust Belt uh, to a kind of a new economic form of a water belt. After all, what causes things to rust but water? So it's all about kind of reclaiming that fresh water that is very much at the center of our lives, even when we don't notice it. Exactly as you heard in Russ's um, introduction, we've got over 20% of the world's available store of fresh water in the Great Lakes watershed. And this has always been important. It was always the reason that industry came to this part of the world and that migrations of people came to work in those industries, but it has a new importance. In the, era, in the era of climate change, when the North American West is in the worst drought in 1200 years, 
the North American East Coast is particularly imperiled by sea level rise. So it puts us in a really, really important position. And so what I'd like to share with you today is sort of what has to happen in order for us to claim that stature as the water belt and um, some of the reasons why, some of the things that are already in place that make that a possibility. And then towards the end, I hope that we can start dreaming together about what could happen and how this water could really be um, the very driver of pretty wide scale economic, social and political transformation. So let, uh, uh, it was working fine back there. How, did, what is the, what's the, uh-huh. Okay, great, it was just, it was only this, okay. So just, I'm um, not gonna go through and, and read all of these slides, but just a, a little bit of an approach. We usually think about water as something static, something that is a feature of geography, so that some places are prone to flooding, some places are drought stricken. We take this as a kind of a common sense fact, but when we do so, we are missing on the one hand, the role that infrastructure plays in conveying water to some places, right? Driving certain kinds of development and not serving other places. So in other words, right, we need to not only think about water as a kind of a static fact of geography, but we have to attend, right, to all of the different human decisions and factors that determine whether a certain neighborhood floods. Is it built on a floodplain, right? Is um, a place served um, by water? And, um, and, right, how we access water. Because this question of whether you are drawing water from a fountain, whether that water is safe, whether your water is uh, controlled by a handful of private owners, but these are all these kind of social decisions. And these social decisions ultimately help constitute what water is like and the availability and safety of water in turn have major impacts on how healthy a given community is, the nature of wealth, um, how much of someone's um, given income per month goes to water. So this is really bringing the human back into our discussions of water. Okay, the next uh, kind of piece of good news, or, or rather um, we'll start with this question of why the Great Lakes and what the Great Lakes mean as a scale. Uh, so the word basin, which is a synonym with the word for watershed, is the notion rooted in biology that ecosystems and soil and species are interconnected through the ways in which water flows across the landscape. In other words, a watershed is a unit of land that is determined by following the rain. What do I mean by following the rain? Well, at least theoretically, right before canals and pipes get involved, uh, when rain falls, it drains across landscape through a certain route, right? It will go into creeks, wetlands, ponds, drain into rivers, rivers go into lakes and into the sea. So that movement, that recurrent movement of rain across a landscape determines a watershed. So you can see here, like theoretically, Chicago is a wild case as we will hear in a moment, but theoretically when a drop of rain falls in the city of Chicago, that drop of rain drains into Lake Michigan, about 20 miles west, right? Right over Ridge Road, which marks the subcontinental divide. If a drop of rain falls there, at least theoretically, it drains into the Mississippi River Basin. So we get to the scale, the unit of the watershed by paying attention to how rain moves across landscape and how water interconnects the kinds of species that are there. What I'm, you know, as you could probably already hear from my language, I am no biologist, <laughs> I am a humanist, but in proposing that we follow the rain, 
I'm making a kind of a social and political suggestion that we might think of a scale of government that takes seriously the fact that all of the people living in a basin at a given time have a certain baseline of shared interest because they are interconnected by water, right? They're drinking the same water, their bodies are absorbing it, right? They are experiencing the same floods, right? The same kind of soil health, the same agriculture. So what you see here, and you'll see it in a few other slides, is a map of the Great Lakes Basin. And so all those areas in blue, when rain falls within them, that rain is part of the Great Lakes watershed. And the Great Lakes watershed, okay, well, well, we'll come back to this in a moment, but the Great Lakes watershed has been historically the, the scale, the unit of some very interesting forms of water governance. And we don't always know that so much in our region of the world, but other parts of the world really look to the Great Lakes for this kind of model of how to use water as a, a kind of a political unit around which people gather. So what you see here is uh, the map of the Great Lakes Basin and its various sub-basins that comes from a binational, a US-Canadian organization called the International Joint Commission. This is widely heralded as the most stable, right, most significant form of water sharing between two countries. You probably all have noticed there's never been a war between the US and Canada. And many people look to this International Joint Commission as the reason why. In 1909, this commission was formed with three commissioners from the United States, three from Canada, and they oversee the water quantity, they examine issues of water quality, and they make a whole set of decisions in a binational form. And again, it might be interesting, maybe nobody's ever heard of the International Joint Commission, but people the world over look to that 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty and they say there's an example of two different countries that have figured out how to share and allocate water between them and make for a very stable um, watery border as a result. Um, we've also got uh, another form of Great Lakes governance called the Great Lakes Commission that is made up again of state governments in the US and Canada. And sorry, it's cut off a little bit, but you know, here you see um, the Great Lakes Commission's, um, you know, basically their, their mission statement, which is to bring different scales of government together in order to coordinate around water policy to preserve the Great Lakes and hopefully to bring the best benefits for those that live in the watershed. Okay, this one's a, a really, really important one and a bit more recent. Anyone ever heard of the Great Lakes Compact? Okay, well, here I am to tell you about it. Okay, we've got one person here. This is a, an agreement from 2008 in which the governors of the Great Lakes states with signatures from two Canadian provinces basically set a limit on how far Great Lakes water can go. And the Great Lakes Compact basically says that Great Lakes water should stay within the watershed to serve the communities here. If businesses or commercial enterprises want to use this water, instead of building a pipeline to them, they should bring their business into the basin. And so this compact, and it, it's, uh, it's standing and it's effective, but it's not foolproof. Uh, we can talk about why as well, but this compact basically prevents Great Lakes water from going in a pipeline to Nevada or California or going in a tanker somewhere around the world. The idea is keep the water here, keep the people here. And um, for those individuals or enterprises that wanna access the water, instead of taking the water out, they can come in. There is one loophole here, I'll tell you, that's called the bottled water loophole. So remember I told you a tanker full of water cannot leave the Great Lakes and take this water elsewhere. 
However, if that tanker is filled with plastic bottles of 5.7 liters or less, a tanker of Great Lakes water can leave the basin. So this bottled water loophole does allow multinational corporations to bottle water here and export it. So we're gonna talk about that loophole as well. But the compact is, um, is especially in the 21st century, the kind of most significant piece of legislation that's all about not allowing, as they say, a giant straw to suck the Great Lakes dry. And many people are thinking that this compact, again, signed into law by Republican President George W. Bush, um, that this compact does provide this region with a kind of legislative basis to maybe coordinate more things. Okay, this is also really important. This is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. This was a 2010 bill passed through the US Congress, signed into law by President Barack Obama, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative allocates independent funds through the Environmental Protection Agency to address sites of legacy pollution. What's legacy pollution? Legacy pollution are places where there were factories or waste storage or waste management, places that have highly contaminated soil, impacted water, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, right? You can see all those dots around our map, especially the concentration of them in our own uh, part of the Great Lakes here at the Southern Bowl of Lake Michigan. This allocates money to, to remediate those sites of, um, of legacy pollution and bring them back into community, domestic or commercial uses. The really important thing about the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is that um, it, it, so far, it doesn't seem like it can be canceled. There were about three, maybe four attempts by the federal government between 2016 and 2020 to be rid of defund the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and politicians unanimously from this region stood up against it. It has wide bipartisan support. And so this is a kind of an environmental legislation that speaks in regional watershed terms, and it has very different reception than environmental legislation writ large. Okay, we also have, and you can see the list here, a number of native tribal governments in the Great Lakes Basin. These are peoples with, whose history in this part of the world is thousands of years long. There is tremendous wisdom, knowledge about water, ideas about remediation that come from Great Lakes indigenous communities. Um, we have learned from them among many things, the idea, the principle that water is life, that we cannot live without water, that water sustains us, and that our social and economic and political practices need to elevate that principle. Here's a, a very different kind of map of the Great Lakes Basin that comes from um, the Red Cliff Band of, um, of Ojibwe peoples. And you see these, um, the animals represent the different clans of um, the Red Cliff Ojibwe. And they are, all of them are standing on Lake Superior as their basis, as their lifeblood. But you can also see um, the kind of plumes of the bird and the heart in the, in the bird and the other clans and the way that that flow of water is depicted as interconnecting all of those clans, right? It's a kind of a form of like liquid affection that moves through the different clans, joins them together and joins them in productive interrelationship with the water itself. So this is a mapping that puts people and other species in the center of water, right? Not as um, something that acts upon the water, but rather um, people who are integrated into it. Okay, and here's a, another principle to, um, to bring to the fore. 
according to U.S. law and according to um, Western um, uh, longstanding um, ethics, water is something that is, constitutes the commons. Commons are things that belong to everyone and can sustain everyone through reasonable use. And there's different kinds of commons. Uh, things like water and seeds and soil constitute elemental commons, things that belong to all of us because they are necessary for our survival. Right? There are also things like social commons, libraries, schools, right? Um, you know, in our time, postal delivery. Um, there are also things that are cultural commons, like the motifs and stories or tune families, right? These are things that both have no owner, but have a collective owner in all of the people. And surface water remains, right? One of these commons that we all collectively own and, um, right, belong to no one single one of us, but yet are under the jurisdiction of all of us. And um, this principle of the commons is on the rise in our region through this burgeoning movement of watershed boards, right? These are groups of people in cities or neighborhoods or communities where everyday people get together and start investigating their water, right? How much water is there? To whom is it allocated? What are people doing with the water? Who's polluting it? And one of my favorite watershed boards is in the city of Milwaukee. Milwaukee Water Commons sponsors one of these boards. And they have representatives of different communities in the city of Milwaukee. They also have someone to speak for non-human species. And they have another member of that committee who represents future generations. And their job is to represent right, those young people or those people not yet born for whom this legacy of water and how safe it is, is such uh, an essential factor. Okay, so um, that's sort of what's going on. That's the basis, but let's kind of, you know, move forward with this principle of the commons, that the lake belongs to all of us and that the set of decisions that we make about water plays a key role in the future. Okay. And here I'll focus a little bit um, because it's our sub watershed on, um, on Lake Michigan, which is home to more than 10 million people, but still faces uh, a set of challenges in the future. Okay, I'm gonna go past this one and let's just do a little poll for everyone here. Um, raise your hand if you think that the greatest challenge facing the lake is pollution. Right, pollution that comes from factories, from pipes, because we've got one, one person for pollution, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, about eight people. Um, what about runoff? So whereas, okay, we've got two, three, so whereas pollution, I'm imagining there, right, pi uh, point source pollution, pollution that comes from pipes, runoff is um, the residue of agriculture, of fertilizers that is picked up by the rain, and I'll show you a slide in a moment that can turn our fresh water green. So what about four for runoff? Did I get that right? Maybe five. What about aging infrastructure? Okay, so that looks like that's also about seven. Um, invasive species. Okay, got two people there. Water privatization. So water services um, owned by municipalities being acquired. We've got one. Okay, and other. Yeah, what do you think the greatest threat is? Okay, so kind of a combination of all of the above, right? Compounded threat. Yeah, any other others that people wanna share with the group? Okay, so this means that in order to have this water belt future, where this water can be at the center of new forms of production, of economy, can help us heal um, some of our deindustrialized and segregated cities, right? These things need to be addressed. So let's talk a little bit about how, um, how that could happen. All right, here's another slide about the bad news. Um, when it comes to water in the Great Lakes Basin and beyond, 
two broad trends that we're seeing are disenfranchisement, ways that people are become alienated from their source of drinking water, whether through very high bills, by being unable to find clear information about their water, right, by being distanced from questions of water use and governance. So we're seeing, especially um, in the 21st century, these forms of disenfranchisement coinciding with the second issue, which is privatization, right? Remember we had that slide about the commons and the way that water belongs to all of us. But certain kinds of legislative and political conditions of the 21st century have accelerated privatization. What do I mean by privatization? Well, I mean, first of all, that drinking water services that were in the 20th century overwhelmingly publicly held and municipal are being acquired by private corporations. I mean, the bottled water loophole that we talked about before. There's also privatization through pollution, because if a company or a corporation is dumping in your water, making it dangerous for you to access for fishing, for recreation, for drinking water, in a sense, your water has been privatized through pollution. So these are the other things that when we're thinking about the future around the world's largest freshwater basin, these are also social trends that have to be kept in mind and addressed. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving past this one um, so that we can move. So let me um, start with a kind of an overview of what must happen in order for the Rust Belt to become the water belt. And here's a quick list and I'll expand upon them in sequence. The first thing that we need is a new approach to water rates, okay? Um, currently, um, we see that aging infrastructure is largely paid for and maintained by the lowest income households, right? We need to approach water rates um, in new and different ways. We also need to think about decarbonization, how to get oil out of fresh water so that it does not contaminate it. Um, number three, we need to think about um, factors of climate change around the Great Lakes which in our case is not sea level rise, but rather radical fluctuations in lake levels with periods of drought and really low lake levels followed by periods like we're in right now of really high lake levels and flooding and the resultant destruction of property. Another big must is curbing runoff, right? That um, movement of nitrogen and phosphorus contained in agricultural fertilizers and pesticides moving with the rain into the lakes and causing harmful algal blooms. So these are the must. So um, let me see what my, okay, let me go back and talk about water rates for a moment. Uh, what we've seen in the past 15 years around the Great Lakes is a 99% increase in water rates, right? Bills have skyrocketed in almost every single municipality around the Great Lakes, the cost of water, and I mean water coming into the household, has had a near 100% increase. You might say, why? I'll, I'll give you another example. So people in Great Lakes cities pay more for water than those in Arizona experiencing um, this debilitating drought. So everyone, right, should probably drop their pen and say, how is that possible? If you live within the watershed that you're paying more for water than desert areas. Well, here's the story. Um, remember on that slide about aging infrastructure? So the Great Lakes is like other parts of the US where water infrastructure was built really big. It was built in the mid 20th century in this era of robust confidence when the idea was, right, there's always gonna be economic growth, there's always gonna be growing populations, we'll build things really, really big, and we'll see what happens next. Well, these very systems built very big in the mid part of the 20th century started losing their federal funding in the 1970s. And so suddenly, right, you had these big systems 
that still needed to function, not to mention sometimes be upgraded, and the funding that had built them was no longer there. So what was said to different water utilities was raise the money through your own people. And so water rates went up. And as water rates went up in the 21st century, we also saw what to me is um, something that is ethically unsustainable, especially in a part of the world with so much water, is we began to see domestic water shutoffs for non-payment. Um, for example, right, this slide is referring to Detroit, to my hometown. Uh, there were 140,000 water shutoffs in the city of Detroit. Um, and we're looking at staggering numbers across the basin. So when we talk about water rates, right, we're not only talking about, you know, um, pay scale, we're also talking about ethics. And that ethic should be that, I mean, no person on earth should be without water, but in particular, right, the place on earth with the most fresh water should never see any household going without water. So what do you do? Um, with the declining federal funding, the big systems, how to pay for it? Well, that's where we get to this question of water rates. I, I wanna say too, that there is some um, very recent um, good news. Um, the uh, current infrastructure bill uh, just passed allocates $4 billion uh, to address uh, water pollution. It also, let me make sure I can see it. It also directs 48.4 billion over five years for drinking and wastewater with about 15 billion um, devoted to changing out um, lead pipes. So right, there's been a kind of a new infusion of federal money, which is a step in the right direction. But you, know, you heard those numbers I gave you, the estimate of how much is needed in the US around water infrastructure in the next 20 years is 1 trillion. Okay, so where does the money come from to keep this going and to make the water belt? Well, okay, water rates. The first thing I wanna say is that we need what are called progressive water rates, where the amount of, that you pay per month for water is tied to your income. So that if you, right, um, about the, the um, the percentage is that uh, no one should pay more than about four to six percent of their total income for water. So if you charge everyone four percent, then someone who's making two hundred thousand dollars a year pays more into the system, but also someone who's making twenty thousand dollars a year still contributes and never sees their water shut off. So that's progressive. That's tying water rates to income. But here's the next thing, commercial users, those enterprises that make a profit from Great Lakes water pay the same thing as households. They just pay more because they use more water. So we've got to charge commercial users, those who make a profit from water more because their profits tied to the water and they've got to be partners in maintaining the system and the high quality of the water. And this one is kind of great because there's not really a race to the bottom, because if these enterprises say we're going to go somewhere else that doesn't charge us, well, nowhere else on earth has the same amount of water. So we've got some leverage there as well. Similarly, there have to be very high fines for companies that contaminate water enough that that money can go back into innovating technologies of remediating and cleaning water. So a whole other scale of how water is priced is really vital. Okay, decarbonization. Another big risk to uh, the Great Lakes here seen from space is um, a pipeline system known as the lakehead system that conveys the heaviest form of fossil fuel on earth, uh, tar sands mined from beneath the boreal forest in Edmonton, right? These pipelines conveying the world's heaviest and most toxic oil run right around and through the lakes. Um, there's a lot that is said uh, around pipelines right now. This is an issue onto itself, but I bring this slide here to show 
that this is over one fifth of the world's water. And so this is not really a place that can risk uh, contamination from a large scale oil spill. Okay, here's a picture of runoff. This is Lake Erie. This is Western Lake Erie in the summer. So what goes on basically every summer, Lake Erie is the shallowest and the warmest of the five Great Lakes. And um, throughout Ohio, there are large agricultural productions. Agriculture has been going on for hundreds of years, leaving the soil pretty depleted. Large scale agriculture addresses depletion of the soil by adding fertilizers. And fertilizers try to spur growth. There are two elements that spur growth. They are nitrogen and phosphorus. Large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus in fertilizers are applied to fields throughout the Midwest. I mean, this is Lake Erie where it's the worst, but you'll see a map. It's not only Lake Erie. And so one of the effects of climate change in our region is that we don't even have rain storms anymore. We have what are known as rain events. A rain event is when high volumes of water hit the earth in an abbreviated time period and overwhelm the built environment. It's got effects of flooding in cities. In agricultural areas, all of that fertilizer gets stripped. It runs into streams and rivers and brings nitrogen and phosphorus into the lakes where it spurs growth. This is blue-green algae that absorbs all of this nitrogen and phosphorus and you know, reproduces really, really quickly. When that algae dies, it becomes, all right, that's where you can see these sites of blooms around the Great Lakes, but it becomes a toxic cyanobacteria, right? That can be um, deadly when drunk. So currently, the way in which agriculture is, um, is functioning is literally another word for these algal blooms are dead zones, right? These are places devoid of oxygen in water where nothing can grow. So obviously, if the lakes look like this, right? You can't drink this, you can't swim in this, you cannot use this. So this runoff and the relationship between coastal communities and inland agriculture has to be transformed in order for agriculture to continue and in order for this water belt vision to come into being. Okay, and here's um, uh, an interesting way. I spoke briefly about the Great Lakes Commission, one of these watershed organizations. Ah, there's something else I, I need to tell you. Uh, runoff isn't regulated, right? So it's a form of pollution that doesn't have um, any limits because there's currently only voluntary programs. We've got no regulation, right? We've got no rules that can be given to farmers, to agriculture enterprises for them to stop. So we'll hold that out here, but I also wanted to highlight one of the efforts being made by these watershed agencies, the Great Lakes Commission, has created this blue accounting, right? A kind of a database for people to see where the blooms are, what kind of practices create them, what kind of techniques might curb them. So, you know, this is one way of people coming together, not in a regulatory framework, but trying to come together to address the issue of runoff. Okay, we're still in the must category. And this is strategies for fluctuating lake levels. The lakes, because of climate change, are warming. When um, the lakes warm, obviously you have less ice in the winter, you have more precipitation, I, I'm sorry, you have more evaporation, and that evaporation is at the heart of these rain events. And so we're seeing the lake levels, right? We're, this is, we're not sea level rise, right? We are not connected to oceans. So sea level rise is not our climate change issue here, but we're going to see really radical deviations in how much water is in the lakes. And here you can see, right, a house, right? The changing lake levels lead to erosion. So we're seeing across the Great Lakes, 
um, erosion, flooding, threats to property. At the current moment, those who have lakefront property and can afford it are building barriers to the water, right? Trying to protect their property by putting a barrier there. You know, who's to blame them? You've got a lake house, you wanna keep it, you wanna transmit that. The only problem about acting on an individual level, which we can all certainly understand, is it just directs the water elsewhere. And the water moves elsewhere with more force because of the barrier has changed the currents. So this barrier, even though, right, one can understand you don't want a town or your lake house or anything else to fall into the lake, it's an individual solution, which is not going to solve the problem. Uh, okay. So, all right, here are um, some things that can be done. Um, green infrastructure. Green infrastructure basically means turning to plant species to help us with changing lake levels and the changing nature of rain, right? How can we enlist trees and deep rooted plants to absorb, hold, store some of that water while also using right, their own cellular structure to filter out toxins? The most important Oops, the most, oh wait. Oh yeah, so here's just um, you know, one form. This is slightly different than the lake level, but there you see um, an example of a city street flooding during a rain event. And here is an image from San Francisco where they've created these curbside wetlands, right? These kind of deep rooted plants that can hold the water and keep it out of road. Okay. But when it comes to the lake, lakes, the most important form of green infrastructure are reconstructed wetlands. Right? We are again on this in the southern bowl of Lake Michigan. This whole region used to be wetlands and dunes. And wetlands and dunes are right that natural ecosystem that holds water, that filter it, that take out toxins. And the thing about wetlands is it meant when the water um, table was very low, right? They could kind of draw, wetlands can draw water back towards human inhabitation. And when water levels are really high, wetlands can hold the water in place and keep the water from inundating the built environment. So have a look. This is a current wetlands map. Um, you can see that the brown dots there are coastal wetlands. These are the current um, existing wetlands, right? Have a look at Southern Lake Michigan right there. Do you see any wetlands? <laughs> okay, so this is a very pressing issue, particularly for our stretch of the Great Lakes, right? We are talking about large cities, Gary, Chicago, Milwaukee. We've got no wetlands. This is where the populations are, where the built environment is, right? Hundreds of years of human culture. And we are not investing in the kind of green infrastructure that will help us move through these fluctuating lake levels. I'm pretty sure that one blue one we see there is a reconstructed wetland um, by a nuclear power plant in Illinois. Um, so I, that is to say that's not, going to, um, that's not going to be enough. But what I'd like to propose right here, remember I told you about the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the one that can't be canceled, that's dealing with legacy pollution. We need to bring some of this green infrastructure thinking into how we address industrial remediation. Because not only do we have the highest population here on the southern tip of Lake Michigan, but we also have waste storage, operating factories and former factories. And if lake levels rise very high, whatever is still in that impacted soil and in those places will get into our drinking water. And so in this way, right, a wetland can be a barrier and a filtration system like no other. Okay, so now let's go, that, those were the must. So let's open this up a little bit and start thinking more broadly about the could, right? What could happen around the Great Lakes to bring this water belt vision into being? 
So I'll give you a little list and we'll see how much time we have to discuss each one. Um, number one, water recycling. I'll show you a few more slides on that, right? Currently, we use water one time, whether it's to wash our hands or wash our car or to uh, make something, we use it one time. And after one time, we treat water like waste and we invest a tremendous amount of money in throwing the water away. So water recycling means, right, reusing water in a kind of an ongoing loop. So water recycling, uh, the next could, municipal beverage industries, right? How do we bring that, or rather close that bottled water loophole so that all that profit around bottled water and other beverages can go in to maintaining and improving our infrastructure. Um, and uh, finally, uh, waste mining, right? How we can have non-extract, or how rather we can source through non-extractive methods all the minerals and the elements we need from already existing, um, already existing waste. Okay, so let's talk uh, about water recycling. Water recycling is the norm in a country like Singapore, where Singapore drinks their recycled water, they call it new water, and they're very proud of that. Um, in uh, February 2020, the US EPA released this National Water Reuse Action Plan. It's motivated by the debilitating drought in the West. So they said, we've got to, in the US, start thinking about recycling water, using it more than once. But the whole plan is missing the Midwest because currently water recycling occurs in places of drought as an alternate source of water. Nobody has yet thought, well, nobody, I have thought of it, I, we are thinking of it right now, um, about introducing water recycling into places with a lot of water, right? Where that also floods. Now, the um, exciting thing is that I don't think we need to drink recycled water, right? We should drink the water of the Great Lakes. However, after we've used that water one time, right? It can be treated to be used for agriculture, right? We can make that kind of healthy interdependency between urban and rural communities by providing agriculture with a stable water supply while getting into a relationship that says, we can't supply you that water if there's continued runoff, right? You build a kind of an interdependent relationship where right now um, often there is, um, there is animosity, right? For heavy industry, there's no reason that heavy industry needs Great Lakes water. Right? We can recycle water for that use, which means that we could preserve the Great Lakes for ecosystem health, for domestic uses, and then reuse that water that we've used in our homes for all of these other forms of um, production. And here, I mean, we don't have um, quite time, but, but you can see the statistics here. Treating water like waste is costly. We store it, we treat it, and then we use high inputs of energy in order to move it somewhere else. So for example, right, the wastewater um, from Chicago, as well as communities around the Calumet River, that ends up being pumped all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, right? That takes a tremendous amount of energy. It has all kinds of negative downstream effects. Um, okay, so you've got it, it's costly. Um, here we see a rendering of the United States' first uh, pipe to pipe water recycling that is going to open in El Paso, Texas. So because of the drought in Texas, they're opening a water recycling center where they're going to treat it to drinking water quality. And that is what El Paso is going to drink um, because there's no alternative. Again, I think in our part of the world, this water recycling opens up the possibility of really rooting a new form of closed loop, um, closed loop industry that reuses this water while protecting the lakes. Okay, um, all right. So the next piece, let me just make sure. Okay, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go um, quickly here. 
let me go um, right here. So let's come back to that, um, that bottled water loophole and think about the possibility of the Great Lakes region being the kind of Napa Valley of water, right? A place known for its high quality water um, and a place where the beverage industries, instead of bringing record profits to private companies, where that bottled water could be under the umbrella of the municipality. And this slide is summarizing this right now. Uh, in the city of Detroit, there is both a Dasani and an Aquafina bottling plant, right? Coke and Pepsi are bottling Detroit municipal water, each one bringing in a profit of about $1 billion per year. Meanwhile, the city of Detroit is experiencing cataclysmic flooding, high costs of water, aging infrastructure. So what if we brought that bottled water industry back under the umbrella of the municipality so that the profit from water helped maintain the municipality and you know, kind of subsidize the cost of water for those that work there, right? This is um, kind of overtaking or, or rather um, absorbing right, the bottling of water and the distribution under the municipality, which could also lead to all kinds of better choices. Right now, bottled water is in plastic. Guess who pays for dealing with the plastic or recycling the plastic or trying to get the plastic out of drinking water? The public does. Now, if we had a municipal um, beverage industry, we would not have to make that out of plastic, right? There are like a whole lot of corn grows around here. And there's a lot of waste of that. You can make plastic out of anything. And um, right, so here's a whole different way of thinking about the beverage industry. Okay, I'm gonna um, end right here with this idea of instead of mining for minerals and fossil fuels, that we go to sites of existing waste and reclaim the materials for production from them. Okay, this one is, is rather uh, close to home. So I'm gonna, I'll end here. This is um, the, the Calumet River that feeds the CalSAG channel. It's got um, a, con a confined disposal facility where um, right, sediment dredged from ports is dumped and stored. It was supposed to be capped this year and turned into a park. But instead of being capped and turned into a park, um, it is going to be expanded. Um, by, wait, let me, let me get the one where I have, okay. Um, it's going to be expanded by about um, 20, a 22 foot um, vertical uh, expansion. This is going on right now. So all of you that you know, live and work around here, we're rather close to it. Um, this is going on right now. Um, again, this fact that the park is supposed to be capped this year and a park created and said it's being expanded. Well, a few things in ending with this. First of all, I think we've got a perfect illustration about what some coastal wetlands could do, right? They could stand between this confined um, waste facility and our drinking water. Um, they could also help to absorb and filter um, uh, some of it but also this sediment that's sitting there is waste, right? Instead of leaving it there as a high cost uh, risk to our drinking water, right? Those that, what is toxic about it are metals. What we need to make things are metals. So this is a whole idea of orienting ourselves towards waste differently, right? Right now, um, all along in particular, the banks of the Calumet River, different forms of hazardous waste is stored but it's stored and then moved by private companies. But the orientation kind of has to be to similarly, like reclaiming that waste, bringing it into practical use so we don't have to keep mining and digging up things um, from the ground. So again, this idea of waste mining gives us a closed loop vision of re-industrialization 
So again, what I'm talking about here is a little bit different than the factories close and you open a coffee shop and build some condos, right? Although we can think about that, what we think about it, but that's the current development model, right? The factories are gone. If someone will pay to remediate it, right? You get a, you know, kind of a like fun uh, urban area. But it also brings up that question, well, what about working people? Right, what jobs are they going to do in that? Or are these playgrounds for those that already have the capital? I'm talking about reindustrialization, but reindustrialization that occurs in a closed loop system. So instead of extracting more fossil fuel and more minerals to make things, we appraise that the waste that's already around us from all the things that have been dug up. And our reindustrialization is making the things that we need from this waste, right? So closed loop reindustrialization. So again, this was uh, the must and the could. Uh, it's hardly exhaustive. And I really present it in order to open up ideas by people living across the basin from their own experiences. But our kind of choices about these matters, you know, really determine the shape of our world. Right, where can we go? Uh, what is our public health? Right, where can we recreate? Where can we be together? How can we collaborate? So these water decisions are about so much more, but they can also right, be at the center of these forms of social reorganization. So thanks. And I think I did that with some time for questions. So if anyone has any questions at all, or if you want to make a comment on what you brought up, take us back to, I know there were some slides, but you went through quickly. So if you want to revisit an idea, that would be suggested. Sorry, eager to ask a question. Sure. I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan on the south shores of uh, Lake Superior. And I noticed a couple of things on the maps, I guess, is the, the legacy pollution sites. Um, if you can kind of describe like what makes those pollution sites, I expect a lot of it was mining related. But what, I, what struck me, I guess, is on Isle Royal, I saw at least a couple of dots. Which oh, I that's interesting. Some mining on Isle Royal, but I, I was kind of shocked to see a legacy pollution site on Isle Royal. Okay, so, yeah, you're right. Way back, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's where the wolves are, right? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't gone there, but I sure want to. Um, yeah, I'm surprised to see. Well, I guess that's the wetland. Oh, wait, those are the wetland map, not the pollution map. That was another shocking thing to me as well, that there's not wetlands near Fort Dupin Mountain. So I'm just wondering, like, sometimes the terrain. That was my two questions. Sorry, you're going back through it. But. I don't know. It's perfectly fun. See, right? That, that's why I love um, going around the Great Lakes and talking to people because, right, it's one basin, but people have very definitive experiences based on exactly where they're from. All right, now we gotta go back. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah, a lot of slides here, huh? Now I'm really confronting it. Okay. Yep, here we go. Yeah, so they are, these um, sites are called areas of concern. And sometimes it's an area of concern because there was production there, but sometimes it's because a site is downstream, right? So if there was mining or logging, I'll have to check. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, you can go on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Action Plan, and there's all kinds of ways to zoom in. And you can kind of see, like, what are they working on? When um, a place has been fully remediated, it's it said that it's delisted. And you know, you want these things to move faster than they do, you know, but there's only like a handful have been delisted since the program began in 2010. But sometimes it's that there was a factory there or there was a mine there, but sometimes it's actually the flow of the river carried the pollution from, um, from elsewhere. Um, but you know, sometimes, and I'm noticing that I didn't put a legend on here because sometimes the different dots designate something else. 
So like back to the, um, the Red Cliff bands that I showed you, their image of the clans in the water. So they use Great Lakes Restoration Initiative money to open the first indigenous run state park. It's called Frog Bay, right across from the Apostle Islands. So there it was impacted. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, but they applied for the money and they opened a park. So it makes me wonder if, because we're seeing different colored dots and I didn't include a legend, but sometimes there were projects that interact with the kind of ecological health of the lakes. And it's not that there necessarily was a factory there, but that there was improvement through some kind of remediation project. I'll check the website, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if we could go to the wetland slide. Yeah. Thanks everyone for remembering this. Uh... <laughs> I live out in the, you know, near Chesterton, Indiana, and we have the, the Crossing Creek Watershed Preserve. Yeah, I've gone there, yep. So Now they, they started to build houses all around the watershed. Yeah. Uh, preserve. And, and so I guess my question is what, what makes it count as a, a watershed? Yeah. Uh, now there's a big boom at the Yeah, I've gone out there. I've seen that. I think there's also a, um, there, a pipeline runs through it too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, yeah. What, one example that I brought, right, because I was, you know, tried to find proximate things for everyone. Um, so one example I brought is a big project to restore 100 acres um, at, um, at uh, Powderhorn Lake, um, Lake Preserve, right? So connecting Powderhorn and Wolf Lake, you know, through wetlands. So this is a, is a big project. You know, Nothing was to scale. The picture here is from Toronto because Ontario has been doing uh, wetland reconstruction to scale, like really addressing fluctuating levels of Lake Ontario by rebuilding these wetlands. So that's an example of three of these huge, huge projects. Now, this one, let me see, right? So this is from... Um, it ha there's a certain area, right? 4HA an area with a surface water connection to a Great Lake. So this map is specifically of wetlands that are have some connection to the Great Lakes. But, but your question, if I can, you know, abstract it a little bit, right? Like what makes up a watershed? And here, if I can get myself back to the very first slide, everyone, thanks for bearing with the flipping. A little review by flipping through. Okay, so if we go. All right, we're going through a lot of politics. Okay. Um, here's what I wanted because you know, what's a watershed? So on the one hand, we have the tendency to just look at the bodies of water and call that a watershed. But ultimately the watershed is determined in many ways by human decisions. So we can't really take the human out of it. Remember I said, theoretically, if a drop of rain falls in the city of Chicago, it goes into Lake Michigan. That drop of rain has like, maybe a one in four chance of reaching Lake Michigan. Instead, it's gonna go into a storm drain. It's going to enter Chicago's deep tunnel, a massive 109 mile, massive underground storage of water and three huge quarries. And then it's going to go to a wastewater treatment plant. Then it's going to be released into a canal, a number of rivers. It's gonna end up in the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a question. Do we share, does Chicago share a watershed with the Gulf of Mexico? Well, some people say they do. It's called a waste shed that we have to see, right? Like where waste goes and all the ways that production, consumption, and waste are all interconnected. 
right? Usually things are produced, the producer makes a profit, someone gets it, we consume it, right? We didn't necessarily make the waste, I never blame it on the people, right? But the waste goes somewhere. Usually it's dumped in low income communities, it's offshore to parts of the world without political power, right? We're forever pushing our waste on um, people who are, um, who are more poor. And that um, those rates of poverty where waste goes also coincides with rape, right? Waste and toxins tend to be concentrated in low income communities, but in particular in low income communities of color. So by people sometimes call that a waste shed. And when we think about production, you know, we've got to think about, about the end game of all of it. And those thoughts, I think, lead to some of these closed loop thinkings of like, there's a lot of waste in the world. There's enough waste that we shouldn't make more of it. We should just live off the waste we've already produced, right? There's enough resources within. So in other words, we have to think about the human in the watershed because, you know, we, we're not dealing with these kind of like ideal forms of how water goes. And so, right, it, it can lead to different things. Cause I think what you're getting at is we restored a whole wetland and then that people came and built very large houses and those houses have all kinds of impact on the wetland. So I think to admit from the outset that humans are part of the watershed can maybe lead to a better set of decisions. So if always that, that um, reconstruction of that wetland was about development, then having that set at the outset so that then there can be some techniques to influence the nature of that development. If you're building a new development, it should run on renewables. It should have green roofs. You know, it should be a part, it should be a functioning part of that wetland. But more often than not, you know, we get sold on these projects oh, we're, you know, this is um, sometimes called gentrification through remediation, right? We're like, we're gonna, you know, restore a pond or make, you know, um, clean up a beach. And so who doesn't want a cleaned up beach? You know, who doesn't want a better park or, you know, native plantings? These things, people like them. But what we're seeing again and again is the kind of seduction in that, that the money, can be invested in places to beautify them because they're imagining other people moving in and displacing those that were there. So this takes a lot more transparency than is currently part of development. Because if there's going to be, you know, I mean, I, I think the wetlands are a little bit different in this, but if there's going to be, you know, reconstruction, remediation, beautification, you know, we need things like community benefits agreements and things in place. So the people that have lived there and dealt with the pollution for years and years can reap the benefits. But, you know, we're seeing it again and again. And now, you know, our eyes are being opened. So it does mean it's a sad that everything takes so many questions. But when a wetland's being reconstructed, the people doing it and the environmental groups and the community groups like have to figure out how to maintain influence over the developers. Because if you're going to reconstruct something and then build energy intensive, you know, waste generating households, you know, you might, you might as well stay where you are. So yeah, that's really important that, that groups, um, I, yeah, I've been trying to think about this um, through some work around Bubbly Creek, really a uh, polluted part of Chicago's river system. And there's, there's a project that's about to start to remediate it. But, you know, what does the existing community do to make sure that once it's nice, you know, they're not all displaced. And so that's another piece of all of this that you can't just, you know, and like, you know, groups like the Audubon Society, it's just, they're not thinking this way. You know, they're like going in and rebuilding a wetland or a prairie, but it's almost like environmental groups and community groups have to find ways of really having like um, almost equal partnerships with developers so that what gets built is in line with the existing community's desire. Yeah.
Yes, um, I've got a two part answer. Um, because yeah, people it, that phrase, I hear it a lot. They're like the Great Lakes, we could be like the Saudi Arabia of water. So my answer, could I see it? It's like a yes, but, you know, so I absolutely think that the future, right, our ability for stability, prosperity, you know, a little bit of de-escalation of some of the tensions in this region, you know, I, I really do see fresh water as the key to that. And I think that, you know, um, doing the research and development around filtration technologies, water distribution, food and beverage, you know, waste mining, you know, all this stuff should all be happening here. You know, I use a water filter in my house. It's like the second one I've used. They're all made in Texas. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, we're, we should be making, you know, there's a slide in here, I think of Steelworkers Park, right? It was a steel mill. That should be a water filtration, you know, components factory. So yeah, I absolutely think that you know, we collectively, we Great Lakes are, you know, have to protect this water, you know, really think about the innovation being centered here and the manufacture being centered here. You know, again, like I said, I'm talking about reindustrialization. I'm not like, oh, let's become like a San Francisco or a Brooklyn, you know, where it's all like high price living. No, like let's make stuff here. That's why people came here to begin with, right? my ancestors, and I'm sure many of yours, right? They came here for that kind of labor. Um, so that's the yes part, but we sure don't want it to look like oil. Um, because if, if you wanna read a um, really incredible novel about Saudi Arabia at the moment of oil discovery, it's called Cities of Salt. Abdul Rahman Munif is the writer. It's been translated into English. It's a must read. It's a very haunting book. And the reason I say no is that it is true that Saudi citizens, you know, do get paychecks and do have grants they can apply for that come from oil money. That is certainly true. But most of that wealth went to ExxonMobil and went to, you know, the government and its friends. So that is, you know, profit for one, a foreign company, and two, you know, for I, um, you know, again, not not to offend anyone with ties to Saudi Arabia, but I think we could say an authoritarian government. So we don't want that version, right? Because if Nestle, um, if the Nestle uh, Corporation bottles uh, the Ice Mountain brand, if Nestle, you know, makes billions in profits we don't see it. Nestle pays no tax in the state of Michigan. They pay a $200 a year bottling fee. And when the Flint water crisis occurred and people had to use bottled water for everything, cooking, drinking, brushing their teeth, taking a shower. I talked to some young athletes who were on the track team and they said, imagine running track every day and having to shower with bottled water. So, I mean, Nestle, had record profits in the Flint water crisis. But it's the commons, right? So it's not like, that. you know, if that were municipal supply, why wasn't a temporary above land pipeline of that water sent to Flint? So why we don't wanna be Saudi Arabia is we don't wanna watch, you know, foreign multinational corporations make the money from water and then you know have a certain political regime held in place by their connection with that company. So that's why this public piece, right, under current U.S. law, water belongs surface water, right? The water you can see with the naked eye belongs to all of us. So it's that all of us piece that I think we really have to stand on when it comes to these new possibilities for wealth in the region. Yep. And I think, right, first for the people that have weathered, you know, so sometimes rocky history in this part of the world, but there's no reason that has to be exclusionary. You know, I think we could, you know, an interesting way to approach things like migration and immigration, what's the absorptive capacity, right? We can model that, right? How many people can safely drink water, be sustained by these lakes over how much time? right, with the ecosystem maintaining a level of health, 
that's a very rational way to come up with policy about absorption. Like how many people can we take? And maybe we can take a lot of people and that's a great thing, right? We, you know, part of the Rust Belt um, negative self-perception is that we've been looking at population drain, you know, especially in smaller towns. You know, we've been looking at what, some 40 years of population drain, but we're gonna start seeing that population return. But we wanna have things in place so that that wealth is widely shared by people that are here. And like I said, you know, those that have you know, been through all the things in this region, you know, that's stability first. And then I think we could be a very, you know, welcoming region, uh, winters, well, winters and all, I can't say anything about that, but <laughs> we'll still have winter. <laughs> I'd like to make a comment in the name of the question. Um, as far as the, uh, um, like public benefit groups and not not for profits like Ottawa Society working with working on those issues. Just in my own experience over the years as an environmentalist and an advocate, I found that some organizations um, really have a tough time pushing some issues of advocacy because they're concerned that there'd be pushback and they may lose their status as a not for profit. Yeah. So it could impact them. So I think part of that problem to be solved by better training for those public benefit not for profits on um, where that line exists for advocacy and also being better able to organize communities who may not be directly associated with them as a not for profit yeah. to push for changes in zoning and um, community regulation that would be able to implement the systems that you're talking about. So they would force for example, if there's a restored wetland in an area, that the building codes would say that they have to um, have bio swale and green infrastructure and things like that to protect that area, but also to build covenants in so they have lower income housing available and things like that so it doesn't just turn into, you know, nice expensive homes that people are priced out of. So that's just my comment. Yeah, it's really well said. Thank you. Um, my question is, are there any examples of municipalities who still control their water system who've looked at making, doing the bottled water, like municipal bottled water company? Um, currently, no. Uh, their Philadelphia does have progressive rates. So it's, um, uh, the rates are tied to income and there is a water board so that, to which people can bring grievances. So no, but we've not seen, you know, a municipality kind of reclaim uh, beverages in, in this way. Um, and if I can go back to your comment, which was really, really interesting. Um, I had lunch with members of the English department and, you know, we were, we were speaking a little bit about um, climate change, like climate scientists, right? Like a scientist like dwells in doubt, right? And unknowing, that's the nature, but you know, because of the nature of discourse, they had to kind of abandon, not abandon, but they had to um, make an exception and kind of state facts in really clear ways because of the nature of the discourse. So when you were talking about Audubon and you know, organizations like that, you know, they're often staffed by scientists, you know, who really didn't, you know, didn't have training in things like social justice, right? Or, you know, inequality and zoning. And they also, um, you know, are kind of scared of the advocacy, you know what I mean? So it's like, so it, it does require, and you know, we're here at a university because, I mean, it requires a lot of things, but a lot of it is training. A lot of it is how staff gets constituted. And a lot of it, it's like, you're not always gonna train your existing staff but when new people are brought on, you know, they should come from impacted communities. They should have different skills. And I'm trying to do a lot of that in um, training of students at UIC, but I think what we can immediately do, right here we are in the hall of a university, sort of like how we do training, because in dealing with things, you know, like the Great Lakes Basin or climate change, it's why it's really important to get the scientists and the historians and the rhetorician and the urban planners 
and you know those people like focused on racial justice and the organizers right making those teams so that these people in their training are kind of learning to work together and learning to say i, I know exactly what you mean about these groups like they get really scared when they've got the authority to say something and it sounds like you've been pushing a lot of them you know i as well a lot of these groups i'm like yeah the neutrality is really important but you know you can't take neutrality <laughs> you know when things are are in peril so the existing groups need to be pushed and they need to be pushed to diversify in all kinds of ways but i think also like what we can do you know imagining we're not running those organizations we're here at a university it's kind of how we configure classes and learning environments so that like a team of students are like working on something like reconstructing a wetland and realizing it takes community outreach it takes communication it takes historical knowledge right it takes a lens that takes into account class and gender and race it takes good science you know it you know it takes politics yeah all those things at once so i think that's the you know that's how we can begin moving towards what you described and I think that in addition to that, well, your role as an English professor, an English professor here with us, also it's, it's learning, teaching people how to build better relationships and not stay in the logical science-based realm, but build relationships with people in those positions in their city, in their county, in their solid waste management board, wherever it is, and then sharing personal compelling stories with them to get out of the logical side because it becomes challenging and people tend to like hear the same thing over and over and so they start to move away from that as being a compelling argument and i've, I've experienced i live in holber which isn't too far away and there's also um a sense of the community coming together and saying what the community feels is a good idea and then developers being more like individuals and saying well we can't in the people in the city like our city councilmen saying, well, we can't impose these rules on the developer. Yeah. The individual property rights are important to them. So I'm trying to figure out how to bridge the gap to where the community stance is probably higher or at least on equal footing with the rights of the individual developer. Yeah, that's a problem because right, the individual developers uh, until that contract is signed remain hypothetical, yeah. right? So you. The, the hypothetical should never be treated in the same way, right, as the existing. You know, that's super, I mean, again, I, I'm, I don't have something, you know, to point to like in the city of Chicago, you know, where we won around these things, but it's super important, I think, to insist on that, right? Like the developer will develop what the council allows it to. And the council is going to do that with the community's money. Right, it's not, I mean, like the word tax abatement is the name of the game. And so that's where I think that real strength is, is trying to pull that lever, you know, around those tax abatements. Because the developers are coming in and basically getting paid by you. So there, there's something to remind them. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, no, there's going to be big migrations. I mean, there's, you know what I mean? I mean, it's gonna come to where else, you know, it's going to be viable. So yeah, we're, we will, you know, we will be seeing big migrations and, even the expectation of that or the knowledge of that was a big driver of the Great Lakes um, 
compact, right? Because the idea was don't move the water to people, move the people to water. So that's absolutely right. Whether more people will come to the lakefront, I mean, actually, that's probably not the best idea because we are going to be seeing, you know, this kind of, you know, flooding at the lake shore and then receding. So, you know, it does make sense, you know, if and when possible to move back from the shore. You know, you always, I mean, I, again, I know that's a little contested around here, but, you know, you always want to, you know, you always want to maintain accessible beaches, you know, uh, you know, again, I, <laughs> that's a big one, but, you know, you want to maintain access points for the public because, right, this is not a place of mountains or, you know, beautiful forests, right? What we have are the lakes. And that is what makes living here really great is that you can go to them you know, whatever you like to do there, enjoy them, you know, that's brings us together. So, you know, it might not make a ton of sense um, to like build closer in because those levels might take out that house. So a lot of people that are there, you know, are looking at forms of reinforcement or even um, when I was doing the freshwater story site, my friend who did the video work, we went, this was um, in Michigan, kind of near Benton Harbor, St. Joseph, and her grandparents like had a beach house that basically like fell in to the lake, it eroded away. We did a whole kind of day, you know, at that site. So yeah, I think, you know, in the basin, we're going to see a lot of movement, but I don't know if going like right up to the edge makes that much sense. I mean, if you've already got a place there, you know, no doubt. If I had a beach house, I want to keep it going. I wouldn't build a barrier. I'd build a wetland, you know, assuming I could. But, um, but yeah, yeah, super interesting. All right, thanks everyone so much, and for staying and all the great comments. Thanks again. <laughs>